Um, I'd like to introduce Michael Schuster. Many people don't know Michael Schuster. He is the co-founder of Mesoblast. Uh, Silvio Itescu was on the panel this morning. He is a brilliant cardio. He, he is a brilliant physician, and certainly it is. Uh, you know, it, it's magical when you listen to Silvio talk. But when you hear about Mesoblast, this is a $2 billion market cap company, $350 million in cash. You're talking about a phase three 1,700-person clinical trial in the cardiac space. But what people may not be aware is that Mesoblast has previously reported some really incredible data along the lines of spinal fusion, and we're expecting data soon in degenerative disc disease. You have lower back pain. Rather than you get an injection of steroids, it might be that cell therapy could obliv obliviate the need and essentially regenerate your desk or restoration of vertebral height. In addition to that, you know, we feature in the CNS piece mesoblast. Why is mesoblast featured in there? Because we believe that mesoblast for wet macular degeneration uh, in conjunction with drugs like Avastin can show some dramatic efficacy. So I'd really encourage you to look at that piece. So here to walk us through the mesoblast story is Michael Schuster. Welcome, Michael. Appreciate it. Thank you. So it's always great to be a last-minute substitute speaker. Uh, luckily, my wife, who's due, who was due with this week with our second child, decided to accommodate by delivering a week early. <laughs> so I think many of you are familiar with Mesoblast. We're an Australian publicly traded company. However, the majority of our clinical, operational, manufacturing, and regulatory team is actually located here in New York City. We're in a unique position. We have a market cap of almost $2 billion and over $332 million in cash. Now, the company has advanced a fair amount since our IPO in December of 2004, but the fundamentals of the company have not changed. We are founded on the understanding of stem cell biology, coupled with the requirement to really superimpose the commercial as commercialization aspects in all decision-making processes. So in order to better understand how we got to where we are today, I think it's important to start with the underlying technology. Now, we believe we've been able to isolate the earliest progenitor cell found in the adult setting. We use positive immunomagnetic selection against a STRO3 uh, marker that's on these stem cells of interest that are extremely rare, maybe one in 100,000 cells contained within the bone marrow. And you could also identify them in adipose tissue and dental pulp. Now, these cells have unique properties such that they're immune privileged, meaning that you could grow these cells up from a healthy volunteer donor into trillions of cells and give them to unrelated recipients without the cells being rejected. The cells work through the paracrine secretion of factors that then will basically allow the body to repair themselves. Now, the company spent a fair amount of time really developing a risk-managed business model. I think there's certain things that we're good at. We're good at translational medicine. We're good at taking a concept from the bench side, proving it up in preclinical models, making sure it's safe, making sure there's signals of efficacy, designing and executing phase two trials. But there's other aspects of clinical development that others may be better at. For example, commercial scale manufacturing, or perhaps even assistance with distribution or phase three execution. And we're cognizant of, of this, and we've taken steps to address these execution risks. And I think, you know, to be fair, not everything we do may not likely work. So by having the cash on hand, we're able to run multiple programs in parallel. So if one does fail, there's another one right behind that, another one six months behind that, another one six, one, six months behind that. And furthermore, with the cash on hand, we've been able to really recruit top talent to further reduce the execution risk. People who have taken products through commercialization from phase two all the way through to completion. And they've been a great resource to our team. Let's talk a little bit about one of our corporate partners that has been able to assist us with reducing execution risk. We have a strategic partnership with Teva, somewhat of a narrow relationship. It's only for cardiovascular and neurological applications. Everything else the company maintains and is unpartnered to date, and we're aggressively developing those unpartnered applications. Uh, and Teva provides a distribution, a global distribution capability. They also provide phase three execution at a global scale. And we've been working very closely with them. I'll talk a little bit about the phase three program that we're initiating now uh, for heart failure. And I think manufacturing, again, we plan for commercial success. It's a common theme you'll hear throughout this presentation. One of the things that we're very cognizant of is if we're successful, we're going to need hundreds of thousands of therapeutic doses. So we went to our partner, Lonza, and we went, entered into a strategic partnership in which they have to meet our supply forecast. Furthermore, we now have exclusivity for allogeneic production in their Singapore manufacturing facility. It's also interesting to note that Singapore is a tax-efficient jurisdiction. So again, planning for commercial success, planning for ultimately an acquirer down the road will see value in a very low effective tax rate. Now, there's other benefits of working with Lanza as well. And uh, this, this relationship really demonstrates our ability to 
make sure that we have everything in place to get to the commercial scale and beyond. So let's talk briefly about our platform. At first glance, it may seem somewhat eclectic. We have a number of programs in phase three, or about to start phase three. A number of programs are now finishing phase two, and a number of programs are just starting phase two, as well as a robust pipeline. I just want to assure you that all these programs are based on strong hypothesis-driven work, followed by robust preclinical models. And while it may seem, again, a little dis disjuntled from wet macular degeneration to heart failure, you may think it's somewhat counterintuitive. Here you have cardiovascular disease, which is a hypoxic environment where we're trying to create new blood vessels, and the opposite is true for uh, the wet macular degeneration situation, but shows you the power of the cells. These cells act as regulars. They know what to do, and in the cardiovascular situation, they create new arterials. In the eye situation, they cap the blood vessels and prevent uh, leaky vascularization. But it's all underpinned by a common mechanism of action. And there's a, there's a number of common themes that our cells are able to do. So we're able to induce polarization of a pro-inflammatory monocyte cascade to a non-inflammatory phenotype. We're able to induce uh, or inhibit activation of T cells and, do, and shift them over to a regulatory T cell phenotype. We're able to stimulate blood vessel growth and reverse endothelial dysfunction. And we're able to improve survival and, and function in a number of different tissue types. So I like to think of our programs in almost three buckets. We have systemic diseases where you may not want to locally inject. You may want to treat multiple different areas of interest. And these are our intravenous franchise. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about them shortly. We have our orthopedic programs where you want to have local delivery, get the cells right to where their need is. And then we have our cardiovascular programs uh, that are partnered now with Teva. So let's talk a little bit about our intravenous programs. Uh, we've shown in a number of preclinical studies that we have a broad immunomodulatory effect of our cells. And essentially, we thought, well, what diseases could we use these for? And, and we believe that type 2 diabetes, diseases of inflammation, like, such as rheumatoid arthritis, pulmonary applications, such as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We know in healthy animals, the cells predominantly go to the lung, the kidneys, uh, and the liver. So those are obvious disease targets where we know the cells go to. Let's see if they have an effect. And we've taken that approach, proved it up in preclinical, and now we're transitioning to the clinic. Let's talk a little bit about rheumatoid arthritis. So we, in January, we informed the public that we're now initiating a phase two trial, 48 patients. We've had IND clearance. We're gearing up now. We're going to be enrolling very shortly. And uh, this is a patient for uh, rheumatoid arthritis where patients have failed a single biologic. Uh, looking for the objective here is not just to sh show what a Humira shows, where essentially 50% of the patients have a 20% improvement in their, in their joints. We're looking for remission. And, and why, why are we confident that we think we'll be able to achieve this? It's because of the preclinical models. We, we've done not the rodents that most people do, but we use collagen-induced arth arthritic model in a sheep model, where we actually deliver the right amount of cells and, and actually look at the histology. And what we saw is that we're able to completely inhibit the inflammatory cascade shut down TNF-alpha, shut down IL-6, shut down IL-17. Each of those is a drug. So it's basically like having Actemra, uh, Humira, and Eli Lilly's IL-17 drug all in one. And I think that shows you the power and robustness of the cells. And we're also now initiating a second trial that's going to be a little bit larger, probably closer to 90 patients in Europe. This is for biologic naive patients. So again, a common theme is that we're, ac we're actually tackling diseases from both spectrums. So early disease, late disease. So that's true for diabetes. So I'll talk a little bit about that now for glucose control. So we're looking at it for glucose control, and then we're looking at complications of diabetes. We're looking at heart attack early, chronic heart failure. Uh, so let's talk about type 2 diabetes. We have an active uh, phase 2 trial, 60 patients. These are for patients who have failed uh, uh, oral glucose-reducing uh, agent. And what we've, again, we had confidence that this is likely to be successful because we've done both rodents, and we've also spent a lot of time identifying a colony of monkeys that from, from, were from Mauritius where they've been eating sugar canes their entire lives and have spontaneous type 2 diabetes. So we spend a lot of time making sure that the models can be translatable and give us increased confidence that what we see in man will, will mirror what we see in, in the preclinical setting. So this trial is ongo ongoing. Uh, we'll be reporting out results in the second half of this year. But from my perspective, what's actually more interesting is not so much diabetes for glucose control. You know, there's agents out there that are pretty effective, GLP-1. So even if our cells are able to induce a, through a single administration and a, a glucose controlling effect for a year, there's a need for that. We think we could address that. But more importantly, patients aren't dying from that. They're dying from the complications of diabetes, such as diabetic nephropathy. And you'll hear, be hearing a lot more about a program that we're now starting in man uh, very shortly for the complications of diabetes. This is, you know, the prognosis is poor. Uh, dialysis, which costs $70,000 plus a year. 
or cardiac death. So we think that there's actually a pathway for uh, accelerated regulatory approval because we, we believe we could treat not only the kidney, but also the cardiovascular side. So I'll talk just briefly about orthopedic. Uh, we released some of these results uh, back at the JP Morgan conference. It was a 24 patient trial for uh, patients who are getting lumbar spinal fusion. So again, this is the end stage. If you look at degenerative disc disease, there's about 4.6 million patients in the US who have severe back pain. About 600,000 of those go, go on to get an invasive surgical procedure where they try to get bone creation between the two vertebrae. On the earlier spectrum, and that'll be my next slide, is the 4 million patients who have failed physical therapy, failed steroids, trying everything in their power to not have to get that invasive surgery. So we started off with the end stage, the equivalent of heart failure, uh, and we tried to show that our cells could regrow, could grow bone between the vertebra, prevent pain, and be as, at least as good as uh, autograft, which works very efficiently, but most people complain their back's fine, but unfortunately their hip hurts every time they bump into the fridge. So what we showed essentially was that the cells administered were at least as good as uh, autograft, which is the gold standard. We saw benefits such as reduced blood loss compared to the autograft group. On the basis of this, we're now preparing for an end of phase two meeting, and we'll be initiating a phase three trial this year. But again, uh, this is just some some images showing the bone, it's x-rays and CT scans. So we spent a lot of time you know, really making sure that the investigators are happy with the interpretation of the data. But what's more interesting to me is the 4 million patients, much larger market opportunity, uh, and it's less invasive. So in this, this is a program where, again, we start off in animals. We did an extensive sheep model where we basically degenerated the disc to greater than 50% of disc height was lost. We were able to show that we could regrow proteic glycans uh, in the disc and restore disc height and presumably in, in sheep that, that they felt less pain. Uh, couldn't really measure that. But uh, in man, the objective here is to reduce pain over six months. So we have now completed enrollment and completed the primary assessment of six months uh, post last patient being followed for pain reduction. So we'll be releasing this, these results very shortly. And uh, I, I think this is a real opportunity where if it's successful, we're going to aggressively uh, push this forward into phase three, and we think it's a very quick pathway to approval because of the short endpoint and the ease of recruitment. So th this doesn't require uh, an orthopedic sales force where they're in the OR ho holding the orthopedic surgeon's hands. This is a pain clinic, which takes 15 minutes. You inject the cells into the disc, and you're out of there. I'll talk just briefly about cardiovascular disease. I think Sylvie did a great job uh, describing our cardiovascular program. As many of you know, we've uh, completed a phase two trial, 60 patient trial, uh, in patients with severe heart failure who are basically at high risk for developing heart failure or hospitalization or cardiac death. And what we showed, we showed concordance of data. We showed there's improvement in volumes, the systolic volume, diastolic volume, there's improvement in six minute walk. But most importantly, what we demonstrated was there's improvement in the heart endpoints. The only thing that really matters in the regulator's, regulator's eyes. We showed that in the therapeutic dose that we're now going forward with in phase three, that we were able to completely have zero heart failure hospitalizations and cardiac deaths versus about a 30% event rate in the controls. So if our therapy is anywhere near as successful, a fraction of this, we think that this could really benefit patient care. And I think I'll just stop here so Jason could ask me one question. Uh, the year ahead, I think there's going to be a lot of news flow. Uh, we'll be releasing results from our intervertebral disc program shortly. We'll be uh, releasing results probably in the second half of this year for type 2 diabetes. We'll be talking about a number of new programs that I just had a chance to uh, briefly describe. And uh, I think with cash on hand, the other thing is, is that you, you, while you may not need to do a deal, uh, that's typically when you get the deals that you really want. I think if you look at why we were able to command such a great deal with Cephalon is because we had a really strong institutional investor base where they were willing to fund $100 million to, to, for us to do our own phase three trial, and we were willing, willing to walk away. So it's a, it's a good position to be in, and, and I think it's, it's good for the field, and uh, we look forward to uh, th this, this venue being uh, much bigger in the coming years. Thank you. Sure.